Hi, we're here with John Shields, chairman of Schaefer Manufacturing, and we wanted to ask John a little bit about the history of the company. So we were hoping, John, that you could walk our audience through the company and its founding and, and, and its founder. Well, uh, Nicholas Schaefer was born in 1814, two years after the War of 1812, you know, when the British burned the White House, and it was a little village, Marienheim, uh, Alsace-Lorraine. And Alsace-Lorraine was right on the border of France and Germany, and depending upon who won the war, which one, one time it was French, another time it was German, and with Nicholas Schaefer, I was sure it was all German, but we have his prayer book downstairs, and it's all in French. So his basic language was, uh, he was a German, uh, but at that time, it was when he was born and all, it was under French rule. So uh, he grew up with the French language, but he was bilingual in both. And when he came over, how old was he? Uh, he was about 16. And, and when he came to the United States, where did he initially settle? Well, I landed in Baltimore, but uh, two years later, that was in 1830, uh, they landed over. It took about six to eight weeks on a sailing vessel to come over because the steam engine had been invented yet. And so uh, they had in Baltimore, but then two years later, in 1832, uh, they headed out for the West, and the horse was stolen and Hagerstown, Maryland. So they put their mother in a freight wagon <laughs> and they walked over the Allegheny Mountains through the Cumberland Pass to the Ohio River. And there they flatboated down the Ohio again because no steamboat. And uh, first they went to Cincinnati because they knew Cincinnati had a large German population. And when I say large, I I would say at that time Cincinnati was probably 4,000 people, but most of them German. And uh, so that's, that's where they kind of started out. And when he came to this country, m many times back then you learned a trade or you were an apprentice somewhere. Did he do that before coming over? Yes. Uh, uh, in Marienheim, there was a little soap and candle uh, uh, factory. And uh, he was an apprentice for a short time in the soap and candle factory. So that uh, part of his idea in America was someplace to work and get his poke together. And then he could go in business uh, in the soap and candle business. And did he start that business originally in Cincinnati, making soap and candles? Not really, no. He was busy just trying. He was only 17 then. And... Uh, he just worked in menial jobs. Uh, he worked as a steward in a hotel. He mixed martyr and laid bricks. Uh, he worked as a, uh, an apprentice in a, a, a tannery for 75 cents a week. Mm. Uh, also did some flat boating on the Ohio River. His idea was to get his poke together. And, and then about six years later, he made his way to St. Louis, and started then uh, what became the largest soap and candle factory in the West. St. Louis had a reputation. It started out as a little fur trading, French fur trading village, but then uh, uh, other people came in, and, uh, and the, with the Mississippi River, uh, back then, why, there weren't any highways and all, so if you were on the Mississippi, it was like a major highway all the way down to New Orleans, which was a big port. Everyone knows of the St. Louis Arch. That's a, it's a symbol that everyone recognizes. Right. What most people don't know is that, that Nicholas's first company was right there between the legs of, of the arch. Is that true? Yeah, I paced it off on uh, such and such 2nd Street, and it was so many paces, and it was right dab in the center of the arch. We used to have a lot of fun. We used to tell people that they built the arch in honor of Nicholas Schaefer. <laughs> But then somebody said, John, you better stop that. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's such a neat story. What, why did the business move? It was there, and then something uh, happened, I guess, that caused, uh, was there a, a fire or something in, in St. Well, Louis? Well, in, uh, in 1849, uh, 
the steamboats then came came along. They weren't there at the beginning. And somebody was smoking, the mattress caught fire, and 36 of the packet steamboats on the levee all went up in smoke, all of the warehousing on the levee and the warehouses, and it really, downtown St. Louis, all went up in smoke in 1849. Everybody knows who Anheuser-Busch is, right? They understand the beer and the, right. the Clydesdales. But, but from talking to you, I understand that Nicholas was actually very good friends with Eberhard Anheuser, one of the original That's founders, right. right? founder, right. Can you talk about that relationship? Were they very good friends? Well, oh yeah, best friends, uh, because both of them are in the soap and candle business. So as soon as he arrived in St. Louis, uh, uh, they became close, close friends. And... Uh, uh, but then uh, a little bit later, by Everhart Anheuser's candle factory burnt down. So Nicholas took him in, and the name of the firm wasn't Anheuser and Schaefer, it was Schaefer Anheuser. <laughs> and uh, and they, were, they were in partnership for about four or five years. And at that time, Everhart Anheuser came to Nicholas and he said, Nick, he said, I, I've got this minority interest in this bankrupt brewery, the Bavarian Brewery. He said, you want in on it? And Nick said, well, yeah, put me down for half. And uh, we didn't realize that, but then the historians found all the documentation for this. And so then the uh, uh, Nicholas Schaefer owned half of what later became Anheuser-Busch. Wow. But about four or five years later, why... Everhart Anheuser came to Nicholas and said, Nick, he said, uh, my son-in-law, the man that's going to marry my daughter, uh, Adolphus Bush, uh, I want to bring him into the firm. Do uh, you want to sell your stock? And Nick said, sure, because there's a brewery on every street corner. He said, soap is where it's at. And then when the Depression came, why, uh, we were just a shadow of our former self. Uh, in fact, Nicholas Schaefer in 1874, there was a panic uh, in St. Louis and all over the country. Today, we'd call it a depression. And what happened, uh, he co-signed all of his Nicholas German friends' second deeds of trust, and they all lost everything, and he lost his fortune. Mm -hmm. uh, he was one of the early millionaires in St. Louis, uh, but uh, uh, he was generous to a fault, and, but he did hang on to the basic, what was left of the company, and pass that on to his oldest son, Jacob, who was my grandfather, and Nicholas was my great-grandfather, and Jacob had one daughter, Marie, and thank goodness for Marie, because she was Nicholas Schaefer's great-granddaughter, and it was through Marie that uh, she passed on the stock of Schaefer uh, through my father who married her, and uh, that's how the family continued on. There's been a lot of things in history that have gone on while Schaefer Manufacturing has been here in St. Louis, like the World's Fair in 1904. Many people, when you talk about St. Louis, the, one of the first things they think of is the 1904 World's Fair, just because it was so historic. Was, was Schaefer involved at all with that? Oh, absolutely. Uh, we have a, down in our lobby, we have the packet that we gave out for the, for the World's Fair, and it included a complete map of the World's Fair, and then it had all the listings of what the prices were at the hotels and, and everything. And it said compliments of Schaefer uh, Manufacturing. Uh, wow, that's really impressive. And that was impressive. 1904. Wow. And uh, so we were very prominent in the World's Fair. Help the audience understand the transition from candles and soap into full-time lubricants. How did that happen? Do you remember or recall? Back in the 1850s and 60s, we were selling soap to two soap brokers in Cincinnati, one named Proctor and another guy named Gamble. Well, Proctor and Gamble uh, ended up being better merchants than we were. Number one, they invented the soap that floated ivory. Uh, we thought 
kind of a gimmick, you know, who cares if your soap <laughs> floats. Uh, our soap was a big slab, like Fells naphtha laundry soap, didn't have a wrapper. We cut it up in big chunks, put our stamp safer on it, uh, Boss Soap, and sold it in the country stores, uh, the Cracker Barrels and all. Uh, but then when grocery stores came along and wrappers were around and uh, why Procter & Gamble soared and our soap business just kind of languished. And then when Edison came along in about 1885 uh, with the electric light, well, originally we knew it wouldn't work because he couldn't get the filament to work and it kept burning. But he did finally get that straighted and, and uh, we always thought, well, candles have been around for 2,000 years, you know. Uh, so, uh, but sure enough, the candle, the electric light did work. So our candles kind of went flat. Uh, when they started out uh, making soap and candles, oil wasn't discovered till 20 years later in Titusville, Pennsylvania in 1859. So we started out in the lubricant business 20 years before oil was discovered because we made Black Beauty cup grease out of animal fats and we made red engine oil out of animal fats for the steamboats. So we were in the lubricant business for 20 years before oil was discovered. The Schaefer manufacturer was still making candles up until the 1950s? 50, yeah. And private labeling the lubricant for some of the big big companies. Is that is that true? Oh, yeah, on, the, on oil and grease and all. And then the company made a decision that in order to, to continue to thrive and to grow, to, to move away from the candle business and focus on their own lubricant? Right. That was really when my brother Tom got back from World War II, and then he took over. My father ran the, the business during the Depression, and, but his business really wasn't in Schaefer. He was in the coffee business with my uncle, who had the old Judge Coffee Company. Oh, sure. And, uh, but he used to come down uh, at lunchtime and check on the guy that he appointed to run Schaefer. But it was a, just a, a manager that was kind of uh, holding action to keep it going. And uh, so anyway, it, was, uh, it wasn't really thriving, and it didn't really take off again until after World War II, and that's when my brother Tom decided that you really needed a brand and you needed your own product. So, so he worked on building a brand and our own Schaefer. Before that, we were jobbers for other people that uh, we packaged the oil for right. in Greece. An important question that a lot of salespeople that would be considering coming to work for our company always have and, and employees everywhere have is if I'm going to invest my energy and my time into a company, and let's say that would have been, as you mentioned, a company that sells out. Do 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 salespeople or employees of Schaefer have to worry about that with the Schaefer Manufacturing Company? Well, this all happened uh, from a tragic happenstance. Tom got Lou Gehrig's disease, and so he died. Mm. And my brother Gwyn was at the national convention, and he died from a heart attack. And Marty Schwab. The uh, Cracker Jack sales manager that Tom and, uh, hired and uh, was building the sales force, he died from a stroke. Mm -hmm. So here we are, a little family business. Uh, I wasn't in the business. Uh, I started out with IBM and then did financial planning. Uh, there really wasn't that going much on at Schaefer during the Depression. It was just a, a kind of a shadow of his former self. But uh, so at that time, uh, Jackie, who is my sister, she and I ended up being the controlling stockholders. Uh, uh, so we ended up owning the company. And at that time, I decided uh, with Jackie's concurrence uh, that we ought to do something to protect the business for future generations for two areas. Number one, really for the salesmen that we were trying to hire because they were already trying to tell them that you're in business for yourself but not by yourself. 
but this was the age of buyouts and sell-offs and outsourcing and everything else. And so in order to save their future jobs and also for the future ownership of the company uh, through uh, the heirs of uh, the Schaefer family. Well, we wanted to be a family-owned company, and so uh, we set up uh, a irrevocable trust. And the way those are written, it's lives and being plus 21 years. It's irrevocable, so we put 51% of our stock in, in that trust so the company cannot be sold. And, uh, and when they say 21 years, uh, my youngest son, Chip, at that time was about uh, 18 or something, 14. And uh, so when you add his lifespan right. and then add 21 years, comes out to about 100 years. Wow. So we could tell our salesmen uh, if they're still in the phone book 100 years from now, <laughs> well, they can be sure that the company will never be sold. Do you remember how large the company was in 1982? The sales were uh, 14800000 And uh, they had a nucleus of a good sales force, and they had the friction machine. They were really launched. They were, uh, Tom uh, brought in uh, Molly, uh, uh, the friction-modified right. lubricant, and also uh, he had uh, synthetics, so it was really the nucleus, and it was just launched. So uh, when he died, uh, I didn't have any knowledge of being able to run it. Jackie was a homemaker, so I brought in a fellow that was very capable, and uh, he ran the company for about four or five years. And then Tom Herman, who had really already had about 10 or 12 years at Schaefer, and my son Jay had been a successful salesman, uh, so then Jay became a sales manager, and Tom Herman, after he got his MBA at Washington University and everything else, uh, became our CEO, and I was chairman of the board. In a sense, you could say we're standing on the shoulders of Tom Shields and Marty Schwab and my brother Gwen and, and uh, Mike Rotersky, and Nicholas Schaefer, who gave us the opportunity in the location. To make sure the audience understands, Tom Herman, who is the CEO of Schaefer, right. is your sister's son, is that correct? That's right, Jack, okay. my sister Jackie's son. And he had worked in the business for quite some time prior to, That's right. he to was, taking he, on that role. He was assistant to Marty Schwab, the sales manager. Right. You know, one of the things that, that makes our company unique being family owned is there's a lot of people that that notice our mission statement and they notice that God's name's in there. Can you talk about that some and and why that was important for you guys to have that? In well, we we feel statement? we're a Christian company and we feel that uh, all things really uh, uh, start with our with our, the good Lord. So we felt it was very important uh, with with God's help. Uh, we'll carry on. And one of the things that's unique that, that, that I have noticed in, in the company is many of your sales meetings, many of your functions where you're getting together with, with your sales representatives, a lot of those meetings, if not all of them, will start with a prayer, which is very unusual. You don't see that very often. Yeah, we always uh, start with grace uh, before lunch or any, and before any meeting. We usually have a say on our father uh, before any meeting we have. Well, that's, that's really, really a neat thing. Talk about, if you could, how much growth the company has experienced since you've been with the company, now well into the, to the mid-100s. That's a lot of growth. Oh, that's right, yeah. Uh, right now, I'd say uh, we're, we're just approaching $150 million in, in sales, and our, and our plan is for the next five years to have it grow on up to... 200 million, but the important thing is we've done this all from internal growth. Uh, we don't believe in acquisitions. A lot of companies can go overnight by buying other companies, but we felt if you buy other companies, then you water down your philosophy, and we didn't water down our, our guiding philosophy, and uh, 
And we're not interested in being the richest people in the cemetery anyway. <laughs> but we've been very successful and uh, with, the, with the good blessing of the good Lord. Recently, I think this year, you, the company had over $20 million producers or the, That's right. that did over a million dollars in sales. That's right. And based on the commission structure that, that Schaefer's put in place, they're doing better than the majority of, of a lot of doctors not making as much money as they're making. Sure. Which is pretty incredible when you think about it from, That's right. from a sales perspective. And the other thing is we've never changed our commission schedule. So uh, a whole lot of companies, as soon as you start making uh, too much while they start cutting the commission, cutting the territories. What we did uh, also, uh, we used to, when we started out, we had set formal territories. Uh, you could go on highway so-and-so, but you couldn't go on the other side. Well, we got away from that. We have areas of concentration, but basically anyone that is using Schaefer Oil, if you happen to run across them, you just back off, that's all. We're very glad we had an opportunity to talk to you today and, and, and find out all this great history about Schaefer. Thank you very much. My pleasure.